This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale Live demo at www.rationale-online.com. This is a Grilled podcast. Um, just so you know, there may be a few right words. So, Mum, stop listening. Um, but all you guys uh, carry on listening because it is fun. But there may be a few swear words because we're chefs at the end of the day and we like swearing. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat under roast whenever I want to eat under roast, not when you want me to eat it. I just remember Brad's smell of his beard. You just had a biggest, fluffiest beard, and I was like, God, he smells so good. <laughs> I don't know why, it's weird. Sometimes you put smell or something to it, and I just remember that, of course, a bit bizarre. Why are you in your chef's white cellar? You're working. I'm cooking burgers. <laughs> oh, burgers. <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And I just lash it all over the hot toast as it melts and quickly munch it up, crunchy, crunchy, munchy. Dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Uh, welcome to Grilled, uh, a podcast by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen. And this is the final series of episodes in series three. Uh, so I have a new co-host for the last four episodes, uh, the lovely Aaron Mollis, who most of you will know from his time at Hand and Flowers, but he does now have a recruitment company called Tasty, which I'm sure we will talk about at some point throughout these podcasts. I'm sure he will take the opportunity to advertise uh, his new business. <laughs> um, so, Aaron, welcome to Grilled. Thank you for having me. It's You're super very exciting. welcome. <laughs> super exciting. Something different than trying to find people that don't exist at the moment. So, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> What made you want to do uh, grills with me? Oh, I, I love I love the staff canteen. I love you guys. Like you, like, you're amazing for the industry, and you know we've had a you know a relationship for God knows how many years now. So yeah, it's just just cool to do different things with great people. So yeah. Okay, yeah. and obviously I said you can pick whoever your guests are, and you actually I don't think you realised how difficult it is to. Pin that down to four people. Yeah, no, no, there was a, yeah, it was a big pool of people, but then you realise that a lot of them either don't want to talk to me or um, (laughs) they've already been on. (laughs) And then, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, I've had to, I've had to uh, go with the, um, yeah, go with a few others. But yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited to, to do it. And and I think we've got some quite different people on as well, which is cool. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking forward to it. Um, So, Why don't you introduce our first guest and why you wanted him to be on the podcast with you? So my first guest is a super star chef in genius by the name of Ollie Williamson, who is now sous chef at the Fat Duck, um, has just won the Rue Scholarship 2021 um, and just someone who's worked in some incredible places and incredibly, you know, great person and I consider him a good friend and yeah I think it's about time that people heard what he has to say about certain bits and pieces. Brilliant. (laughs) Ollie Williamson welcome to Grilled. Good morning. (laughs) How are we? Thanks for inviting me yeah really good yeah. Good 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 well you might say thanks now but by the end of it you might be like oh god why did I agree to that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Right so first off how do you both know each other? Well, I suppose, yeah, just through the industry, like, yeah, you hear about Eve's Head Chef at, at Hand and Flower, so you hear about each other. And then when I started at the Duck, he was he was living just around the corner and he pinged me a message one day and he was like, do you want to come over for some beers and a Domino's? So the rest is, yeah, that was like a year ago. And then we've just been in touch a lot more ever since, really. It was, yeah, went from there. <laughs> Okay, so that's how the love story started. Yeah. Dominoes and a drink. Romantic dominoes in his uh, in his hut in, his, in the garden. <laughs> yeah, it was romantic. there was lo- there was like fairy lights. I knew it was for, he was for me because he got extra garlic dip. Oh, <laughs> you know how to treat a man. <laughs> yeah. It's like three degrees outside as well. Yeah, but yeah, but the. The intense atmosphere warmed us up, didn't it? It was like, yeah, lovely. (laughs) (laughs) So much romance. Okay. (laughs) Um, So to mix it up a bit for the last four episodes, I um, I have put away my wheel of truth. And then we're going to go for um, two truths and a lie as prepared 
by um, Aaron and Ollie. So um, they're going to tell us those and then they're going to try and work that out um, through a series of questions. Hopefully they will figure that one. Um, and who would like to go? Who would like to go first? I, I don't mind going first. Should I go first? Go on then, Aaron. So mine are all industry based. Um, so, <laughs> so first one, I ran away from Royal Hospital Road after just six days of working there. Um, second one, I got thrown out of the kitchen in my first week at the Hand and Flowers. Yeah. Got told not to return. Um, and my last one is I once served customers blue mashed potato. Right, okay. I feel like all are quite believable, actually. Ollie, what about you? I think Gordon Ramsay thing. How long ago was that? Probably like 10 years ago. Uh, no, that was uh, in 2002, 2003. And, and it was after six days. Mm. I think it would probably be less than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, and what was the second one again? You got told never to return. I got, I got thrown out of the kitchen at the Hand of Flowers in my first week. I don't think anyone's ever been thrown out. Well, they so might yeah, now. Yeah. I mean, it's under the rule of Tom de Kaiser, so he probably throws everyone out of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon the Gordon Ramsay one's a lie. I reckon it was less. Yeah, he's right. Oh, well done. Right. <laughs> the reason I served blue mashed potato, right? This is a, uh, this is quite a good story. So when I, when I was in a when I was a commie in a uh, in a hotel, we used to have this like separate like kids restaurant, and I was so in the shit. I didn't have time to make proper mashed potatoes. So I grabbed some like instant mashed potato out of the dry store, like uh, what's it called? Um, oh, like smash. Yeah, smash, that's it, yeah. And uh, I, made, I made it in an aluminium pan with a whisk. Oh, yeah. So the reaction turned it blue. <laughs> and I, I didn't have time to remake it, so I just sent it over and, and the kids had blue mashed potato. I bet the kids loved that, though. Um, yeah, their mums and dads didn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my children would definitely be buzzing if they got blue mashed potato. <laughs> They'd be expecting it to taste like bubble gum or something, though. I think. They yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was three. It was well, two and a half days at Royal Hospital Road that I did a runner. What was it that pushed you to to do a runner? I was just scared. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it. I was like, no, <laughs> this isn't for me. <laughs> but bearing in mind, I'd come, that was the first job it back into a kitchen since I was selling mobile phones. So it was probably, a, yeah, probably not the right career move, to be fair. Okay. Um, yeah, from, from, you know, from living for the weekend, Monday to Friday, doing nothing for five years and then going to work in one of the hardest kitchens in the country, yeah. not the world, yeah. probably not ideal. Have you discussed that runner with the chefs that were in that kitchen at the time? There wasn't anyone there that I remember. I, was, um, I, I don't think I remember anyone's name. <laughs> so you've got away with that, really? You haven't had to bump into them in later chef no, in life? <laughs> no, 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 I think I told, um, yeah, I think I told a, people, a couple of people who've, who have been there since, but they were like, yeah, it happens every day. It <laughs> <laughs> happens every day. <laughs> you're just, uh, you're just, yeah, you're just. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. Ollie, let's have your uh, two truths and a lie. Well, I've done the opposite. I've gone for no, no industry questions, like just trying to find different stuff. Um, so uh, when I was young, I loved Nelly so much, I walked around with a plaster on my cheek. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, I used to play drums in a band with Sigala in the garden shed. And the last one, uh, I've never skinny dipped. I reckon that's a lie, because I reckon... Daniel probably stripped you off and threw you in the river on your last day at midsummer. Well, didn't strip me, but did get me in the river. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas, Christmas Eve. I'll tell the story later. I'm going to go with uh, you never skinny dip then. Yeah, boom. You too. <laughs> we know each other too well, don't we? I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you need to elaborate on your other your other stories then. So Nelly, you obviously just were a massive fan, right? I hope it was not in the kitchen, so you'd have to wear a blue plaster, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, we're talking like 10, 11 years old here. It was like <laughs> hot in here was out. <laughs> that song he did with Kelly Rowlands. I just thought he was a legend. 
Okay. <laughs> I'll be one. Put my hat on sideways. <laughs> well, need, Amazing. We need some photos of this as well, I think. No. no yeah, way. you must have photos of this. <laughs> You're lucky this is pre-social media days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Sagala. Yeah, random. His mum his mum and my mum went to school together. And then all of his... He has got two brothers and they all play instruments. And so we used to play like, I don't know, old rock classics in the garden shed. And never, never skinny dips. In the rain in uh, Malaga, I think, two years ago. Ah, okay. I didn't get skinny. I didn't get stripped at midsummer, but he did. I'll tell you a funny story, maybe. Uh, he so when I left, everybody used to get thrown in the river at midsummer when they left before health and safety went mad. Um, <laughs> and I was, and I put up a proper fight. Like there was, there was a lot of guys trying to get me in there. And I was like, you won't get me in there, no way. Um, and so him and Sophie, and he was working at the time, they stole my car keys, that packed them with a with a, a bike light attached it to a rock and threw them in. They said, okay, we're not going to throw you in, but you've got to go get your car keys. I had to just jump in Christmas Eve. It was absolutely blisteringly cold. So I just jumped in in the end. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, the good old days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Right, well, thank you both for those. Um, so <clears throat> let's uh, start off with, because this is podcast will go out, and it will be 2022. Scary. Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on the hospitality industry for 2022? Are we positive thinking? Um, are we not sure where we're going to be at? Always what are we thinking? To be optimistic about it and positive, but I mean, things are bleak, but I mean, I don't know. It's not going to be as bad as it has been. I think, you know, it can't be. It can't get any worse than that, to be to be completely honest um yeah. it's, it has to get to a point where it's it's just it's just normal this this situation that we're surrounded in or this the c word is a normal you know what i mean it's a it's part of day-to-day -day life and yeah. we just need to you know carry on because to be perfectly honest like we've had a whole year or more to put a plan in place to make sure that what happened last year didn't happen and it feels like it's happening again yeah, so yeah. it's yeah i think yeah we have to stay positive and and well, it's, at some point something's going to give as well right like i don't know um last year when i first started at the duck we had 34 chefs and this year we're going to have 20 going into 2022 so and we're still like maintaining the standard but you just adapt to survive and I don't know, there's some point where you can't adapt anymore, so something has to give. I don't know what it is, but yeah. It would be nice to go into 2022 with a positive outlook, wouldn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah. it's got to be positive, I think. You, you have to put your positive hat on, even if you're not feeling good, because there's a team of people relying on you to do so, you know? So how is working at the Duck, Ollie? Because a, a lot of young chefs will probably look at the Duck and be like, that is their goal that's somewhere that they would love to it's a three-star restaurant somewhere that amazing that they would love to work so how yeah. how is it in reality working at the duck i really love it i mean i think there was a point where you know like i heard stories that people just stand in the corner and they're doing like taking the individual like filaments out of pink grapefruit that great. and that's all you do all day but that's just not it i mean especially as we're adapting to survive we need so much more from people these days and um I mean, in the, in the year that I've been there even as well, actually, with, like getting away from water path cooking, there's a lot of kind of, you know, uh, we, we don't cook fish or meat in the water bath as much, nearly as much as it used to be. So we're like really kind of going back to, back to the kind of old school of cooking, I would say a lot more, which is nice. Um, I love it. I, I love the, the atmosphere there, the, the kind of the management team, just make it a positive environment. It's not like, super dead serious and we we try to encourage people to to grow and you know move people around on sections a lot and they a lot of the time they don't have a choice because there isn't anyone so they just got to bounce around a lot but <laughs> but yeah I mean I commute from London every day so if I didn't love it I'd, I'm probably a bit mental to do that anyway but I really enjoy it and I think there was always that um kind of idea that the fact that was that 
like there's 50 chefs and one person does this for 15 hours a day and then they go home and they come back the next day and they do that and then but if you actually go and eat there especially well I can't remember last time I there maybe a couple of years ago and it is it is just food do you know what I mean? it is proper you know it is proper cooking yeah. it is a beautifully piece of you know roasted meat for the main course or fish or and it's not yeah I think it it, it feels more so now that it is more proper cooking if that makes sense like traditional you know proper cooking yeah i think it's a great time to join as well because we're doing this like anthology series at the minute so 25 year anniversary so i'm basically just seeing all the dishes that have ever been made you know so it's a great time to work there for the guys that work there now they get to see all the old classics it's not just like one menu for three years or whatever we change it every two or three months so that's that's pretty good if you work there at the minute you get to see all of that so so let's let's go back a bit uh, for both of you actually like let's talk about your journeys within hospitality because i'm sure they're very 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 different but very different <laughs> um so ollie how have you got to this point where you are now and was that always in the back of your mind that you wanted to work at somewhere like the fat duck or did you not have a plan and you've kind of just gone with it well, I never really, no, I never really had a plan, and I, I don't think you really can. Well, well, I don't think I could have. I just took the opportunities that came and the, the advice that came at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was like eighteen, when we, I was watching Australian Master Chef, and the chef I worked for at the time said, "Go and work in Australia." So I did a year there. Um, and then I came back and then I worked for Daniel. He was like, you need to go to a free star abroad. Um, so Ian Scaramusa helped me go to Bennu. Um, so I went there for a year. And it was just, I suppose, yeah, it was just listening, listening to the advice of people and just going with the flow, really, that, that got me to this point. I never really said, OK, I want to get there mm -hmm. and then I'll try and do this, this and this to get there because I don't, I don't, I don't actually think that it works like that because things change so often. You've just got to be flexible but listen because yeah the guys at the top usually have the best advice yeah but Aaron is that something you can kind of relate to and I mean obviously you've gone a completely different path to like what you're doing now yeah I mean um yeah with regards to I, I mean my yeah my journey in cooking and hospitality was yeah very different I started you know cooking when I was 15 and then realized that all my mates were going out and chatting to women uh, you know and I was 18 years old and I'd never been in a pub so I was like I'll scrap this I'm gonna you know do a dead-end job for a bit and that lasted far too long and went on for five years and um I, I think I spoke to one girl in five years so that was good um and then, <laughs> and then yeah jumped in like I said jumped into Royal Hospital Road which was complete you know but I think everything happens for a reason if I didn't go there and last three days then I wouldn't have ended up cooking for a mate of mine who was best mates with Tom and then I wouldn't have ended up at the hand. Absolutely. So it's just, yeah, I just, you just go with it. And when something feels right, I think that's the time when you, you know, the time when you start to, you know, think about the next move and then, you know, get advice from, you know, your, your mentors and your peers and, and just people around you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, hindsight is lovely because you can look back and go, actually, those things happened for a reason. That was, yeah, yeah, that exactly. was great. I'm sure at the time you were like, shit, yeah, <laughs> what am I going to yeah, do? do? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, just grabbing my knives and legging it to Sloan Square Tube Station, not looking, you know, not taking a look back. I was like, I wasn't thinking about, you know, what my job's going to be tomorrow. I was just like, I just want to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ollie, is there anything that you would... Uh, that you would change about your path to where you are now if you could could go back and do that probably not actually at the minute yeah no i mean there's a lot lot of uh, mistakes i've made don't get me wrong but they make you who they you are aren't doesn't it so uh, yeah i don't think i'd change anything Aaron, i'm assuming you'd probably quite like to have talked to more than one girl in five years right yeah that would have been nice yeah, yeah. <laughs> i would do you know what i'd love to have stayed at royal hospital road i like i like the place is incredible do you know what i mean it's like and I, but it just wasn't for me. Like there's so many chefs that like, like Paul Lanesworth, um, you know, uh, John Walton, like loads of people who've gone through the, you know, Claire Smith, like 
do you know absolute cooking legends that have um gone through you know, legend, but... Ramsey Steve hey you still a cooking legend so you're right well I'm, I can smash out tea and toast every morning so I'm happy with that <laughs> I'm, I'm blue mash yeah I'm blue mash yeah <laughs> if you want the recipe I'll uh I'll stick, we'll stick it on the staff canteen <laughs> website, website it'll be the most viewed recipe <laughs> of 2022 <laughs> yeah, I'll do a little bit, you know, I don't know do alum, does aluminium pans work on induction though because I've only got induction at home so I don't oh. know <laughs> that fancy emoji there (laughs) (laughs) do you think um you could do uh, royal hospital road now me yeah do you think you could go and do it now (laughs) are you mad oh my god i couldn't even i couldn't i could yeah like i said i can barely manage tea and toast in the morning but um no is it like cooking's a young man's game and i'm i'm 40 next year or you know when this comes out it would be this year i'm 40 um sorry um, about reminded you of that hey, yeah, cheers <laughs> cheers uh i mean i'd i'd like to say yeah i, I could smash in the meat and fish of royal hospital road but no way i'd go down like a sack of cats <laughs> <laughs> ollie what about you? Would you is it something you'd fancy <laughs> Uh, yeah, why not? I like a challenge. Well, that's it. Now it is your I'm inbox is going to your inbox is going to be full of um, Royal Hospital Road job offers now, mate. You're supposed to come to me when you want your next job. <laughs> <laughs> First plug of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. Um, so, to, on a flip side, I obviously asked you, is there anything that either of you would would change? Um, but what has been the highlight of your careers? so far um probably if i had put it down to one moment it was at midsummer um when a load of people left like three people left in march all at once and we had to make we had to reduce the hot section so usually one person cooked meat one person cooked the fish and one did the garnish we had to make it one person cook the meat and fish together and one person cooked the garnish and it was a really savage time but the whole summer i cooked the meat and fish all of it for everyone. And that was probably like the best, yeah, the cooking highlight for me, that's the best I ever cooked. And cause it was just, yeah, it was absolutely savage. You were cooking everything to order. Turbot on braisage, scallops, salamanou, pancit foie gras, roasting rack on the lamb, uh, roasting racks of lamb, like cooking it all and carving it yourself for 60 guests every lunch and dinner was, was savage. But yeah, I mean, it made me, yeah who I am today, I suppose. That was probably the, the pinnacle, the best I've ever kind of cooked in a moment, I would say. Okay. Aaron, does that sound like a highlight to you? No, so if you can do that, I mean, <laughs> again, no, I couldn't do that. Jesus. I haven't even do it now. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... I, like, I've eaten at Midsummer a lot and I know Daniel very, very well. And to be able to do that for that amount of time, but to take on that responsibility is... Yeah, it's phenomenal. You have to, you have to know, you know, you have to have your, your, your wits about you to be able to cook at that level, and 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 it's it's precision as well. It's every single piece of meat and fish and whatever. It's perfect every single time to do that. Like it, that takes skill. Uh, obviously, I've had Daniel on here as a co-host. So, what's he like to to work with, Ollie? Obviously, yeah, he he's very savage, but he's like a culinary godfather to me. I mean. Uh, yeah now if I need any advice or anything like after working for him for three years or whatever um, <laughs> I grew so much I started there as a demi and then left as senior Sue so he pushed me to the absolute limits and showed me you know what what cooking was all about really I thought I was really big bollocks when I went in there but then I quickly got grounded and then came back up the hard way I, I suppose but I mean I've done all sorts with him and he teaches you more about life as well I mean, I've gone, he bought a farm and we used to go and chop trees down and all that kind of shit. And it was like, just, it wasn't just cooking. It was everything. Like you can't walk down the path. If there's a bit of litter, you have to pick it up. Like just about the restaurant and caring and every little detail matters. Any stories he'd probably rather you didn't share that you'd like to share today? I've got a good story about Daniel, actually. Have you? Go on, then. The, first, the first time I ever met Daniel Clifford was... Um, was at the Hand and Flowers. They, uh, there was, I think it was Marlow. There used to be something called Marlow Food Festival, and 
Um, so there was Tom, Claude, Daniel, Scott, his head chef at the time. Um, who else was there? Uh, I think Adam Simmons might have been there. Sat might have been there. So they all sat before the bar area was built. There was like an outside area. So they they rocked up like a table of 10. Bear in mind, there's like, you know, 12 mission stars on the table. And oh, we're going to have lunch. I was like, oh, Jesus. So Tom popped in and he goes, oh, we're all sitting down for lunch. So my bum hole's doing this already. I don't know what all the chefs behind me are thinking, because like, yeah, to cook for that amount of, you know, legends um, was, uh, yeah, quite daunting. But then we'd, we'd managed to get through lunch service unscathed. And I was in the, um, I was in the walk-in fridge giving a couple of demis a bit of a dusting down because they hadn't cleaned down properly. And uh, Daniel walked <laughs> Daniel opens up the walk-in fridge, looks in, he sees that I'm giving these two lads a bit of a hard time and offers me a job. He goes, whatever Tom's paying you, I'll pay you double. <laughs> I, I think he liked my management style at the time. <laughs> I was like, cheers, chef. And that, yeah, that's, that's how I met Daniel Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, what about you? I mean, it's, it's unfortunately he's not on this because I do enjoy watching him squirm when he's not sure what people are going to say, but yeah. <laughs> Favourite Daniel story. One, one of the favourites that springs to mind when you say that is, yeah, this, this farm that he bought. Um, we used to go like on Wednesday lunches when it was a bit quieter, when we had boys. He'd be like, right, come on, we're going to the farm. So we'd go down there and um, he had a boat. So he had, he had a, a, like a lake thing with an island in the middle and he wanted to cut all the reeds down. It's probably highly illegal as well, but it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> I was on the on the front of this boat with a chainsaw, <laughs> chainsawing into the water, and he's he's sitting on the back weighing it down, just chuffing away. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably one of my favourite stories. Yeah, just that that image in my head, like I'm I'm going down. This this chainsaw is like spraying water all over me. You're not supposed to chainsaw into water anyway, and I don't know how to use it, so I was just like, yeah, caning in there trying to get all these reeds out. And then he's just on the back, like on his phone, like smoking while in the boat down. <laughs> you done yet? You know. <laughs> what a guy. What a guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, sticking with uh, what, uh, what Aaron said and cooking for, um, obviously, a table of, of culinary legends. Oh, you've obviously, we've mentioned this already about the Rue Scholarship. I feel like you maybe you know a little bit about cooking for uh, a lot of <laughs> some culinary legends. So. How was the uh, how was the Rue scholarship again? Was that something that you you always wanted to do, or did you someone say to you, or oh, you should give this a go? How have you yeah. ended up as the Rue Scholar Twenty One? Um, well, a guy when I was at Midsummer, one of the sous chefs entered, and they got in, and that's where I kind of first heard about it. And I was like, yeah, I really want to do it. And then yeah, I went gallivanting around a bit, and then never sort of had the the time to do it. And then I was like, well. It got to a point where it was my last year to enter. I was working with Alex at the greenhouse and he was like, yeah, let's do it. I'll, I'll support you to do it. So let's go for it. We put an entry together and got through. And um, kind of the rest is history, I suppose. But the semi-finals are an absolute nightmare because I just stressed myself out into oblivion thinking I'd never really done a competition. So I just put, it was my last chance. So I put all, so much pressure on myself. I didn't hardly sleep. And yeah, it didn't, I got through... Claire Smith said to me, she said, um, you cook the best fish of the day with the best sauce, everything else would shit. So I like, got through like skin of my teeth on, on that one. So luckily that, you know, those, those lessons I learned at Midsummer and other places of cooking fish helps. Just like the Rue Scholarship, the, the stages are going for it. It's just phenomenal. You have to yeah. be at the top of your game. Like I never entered, like not in a million years. I made blue mashed potato for Christ's sake. Um, <laughs> But, <laughs> but that's um, gonna haunt you now, Aaron. Like, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, but the um, just the like the written entry at the start. I've known so many chefs that haven't got through because of that. Like it's like yeah. it's scrutinised, like grammar, punctuation, spelling, like everything. They need to know that you are on your game. Yeah, and like that's to why be able to yeah that's tell people to enter because I think even that. That first process, you don't really do that very often, you know, writing a recipe, costing it like properly. As a chef, you very rarely do it. Like normally somebody in a, 
in a like the computer side of it would do that or like a, an owner would work out the costings you wouldn't really do that so much so as a chef to party or whatever and so i think that's important for people to learn even that process and then yeah try not to shit yourself if you get if you do get through is another lesson to learn um yeah i do think every process is is key to it and then i suppose i i want one on merit of all the things I have learned from everybody that I've worked for. I mean, it's a hell of a hall of fame that you've joined as well, isn't it, Ollie? So what a family to be a part of. Super happy to be in it. It's crazy. They added me to the WhatsApp group and I was like, fucking hell, there's some people in here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there was a Rue Scholar WhatsApp group. Yeah. It's scared oh. to write anything in it, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just watch the side. <laughs> just a, a voyeur of the, uh, of the WhatsApp group. <laughs> so how did it feel when they actually said that you'd won? Because that, you know, it's, that's a hell of an achievement, as, we, as we've just said. Yeah, I didn't really know what, what was happening at, at that time. I was very, I was speechless. I don't know if you watched the awful uh, speech I gave after, but I just, yeah, I didn't know really what to say at all. It was just, I didn't, didn't know what was going on. I didn't, I didn't really understand fully like how my life was going to change, but I just knew that it was... Now look at you on the Staff Canteen Grill podcast. Repping with Cara and Aaron. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe I need a, a grilled podcast WhatsApp group. <laughs> <laughs> with a, yeah, with a very ill-fitting um, hoodie on. I need My new, new Year's resolution is to lose a few pounds because I'm no longer a medium, I can tell you that. Yeah, I went to large thing like, You can't you see should, my man boobs in this, so it's fine. You should always go large, I think, yeah. on a hoodie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> um, Super size me. <laughs> Aaron, mm -hmm. are there any questions that you have for Ollie? For, for young guys coming in the industry and they, they look at your, I mean, because you've, you know, that's not sugarcoated. You've worked in some of the best places in the world. Like, what would, what's your advice to like, to the next generation? Because you've, you know, you've pretty much, you know, ticked most boxes that anyone at that, you know, at your level as as a sous chef. Like, you've worked in some amazing three stars, two stars. You've gone on and won the Rue scholarship. Like, you, you know, you've kind of smashed it. Up and you know, up until now, and I'm sure you'll go on and, and do you know amazing things and do your own thing or whatever. But just from from what you've learned and your journey, what would you what would your like top tips be for for young young the young guns, the next generation coming in, in into the industry? Top tips, definitely one thing that that comes to the top straight away is is don't give up so fast. I, I've seen a lot of young young chefs just like they're doing six months here, three months there, like dotting around. I think people just need to devote a bit more time, like find somewhere, really think about where you want to go, find somewhere and then stay there for a couple of years minimum, you know, and then if you you, you feel like you, you're at a good stage, then move on to somewhere else and apply yourself again and do a couple of years. There's so many people, yeah, doing six months here, three months, you see all these CVs where people don't really apply themselves and then you don't get anything out of it because, I mean, it takes three months to even understand how a restaurant runs minimum, like if you go to a new place. So, if you're only working there three months, you don't really get it. So you want to get it and move around and learn all you can from that. Really like, yeah, use it as a resource and then move on, do something else. Definitely travel as well would be a top tip. Like try and do visas. There's, you can do a one-year visa in America, one-year visa in Australia. Those are, those are things that I've, I've done both of those. And I think, yeah, they, I mean, when I went to Australia, I didn't even wash my own, you know, bed sheets and clothes. So I just totally changed as a human when you come back you're so much more rounded you've seen another culture like I, I fell in love with um Thai cuisine and Chinese cuisine when I was in Australia so you get to go and see stuff that you don't see here and I think it just rounds you more as a person as well seeing other people's yeah cultures and so those those two tips I'll be like travel and apply yourself more stay somewhere longer like don't but it, but do your research first before you before you go somewhere, don't just jump in two feet and be like, yeah, I can travel across London to work somewhere because you can't. So like, just be realistic and, and, and try and do it that way. That's what I would say. Yeah. Stick, I it, stick it out for longer than two days, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do my research. It wasn't for me. Yeah. 
then you did it often. You stuck it out with hand and flowers and did like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what speaking about CVs, what's the obviously both of you will have seen plenty of them in your time. What's the worst thing that people put on their CV? Like what is the thing that you're like, oh god, no, immediately no. For me, uh, like someone who talks about themselves in the third person. Okay. <laughs> like if you've written a CV like that, then you need to what like really? so yeah, it'd be so you would write it as like. Ollie has won the room scholarship in 2021 and Ollie has done like no 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 you sound no. like the voiceover for MasterChef. <laughs> <laughs> well if all this goes tits up then you know <laughs> BBC listen up give us a job <laughs> <laughs> okay so third person that's a, an instant no for you for me for me it is I think you um you potentially uh think a little bit too much of yourself um yeah the biggest thing the most important thing if i see the word clean on a cv like you i work cleanly i work con- like that that to me is mad if you can work clean and you can work to systems and structure then you can you've got what it i think you have then what it takes to be able to you know go on and do things like because you have to, you have it in order to work at a starred level one two three you have to work cleanly the moment you don't see you later you're done but i mean anyone could write it on paper so you, yeah yeah for me it's hard to judge from the paper the like that yeah cv just get them in and then see how they they work i suppose you you can know quickly yeah. after that it's harder for you Eric, mm. because i suppose you you have to rely on a good cv to you, you know, do but, and, and also that like the first bit like that personal like profile them writing about themselves like you can kind of understand like the kind of the person that they are just from reading it do you know what I mean um and then obviously you can have a chat with them and then you know see what they work but see what because it's all right listing where you were that's not going to tell you it doesn't tell you anything about that person yeah it's tell you where where they've worked like if they explain their passions in the industry or why they got into cooking and where they want to be and what they want to do then you know, you get more out of that, you know, little paragraph than potentially you would from just seeing yeah. where they've worked. Yeah. How do you guys feel about writing a CV yourselves? Because I, I think the last time I wrote a CV would have been coming up eight years. I don't even know if I know where to start now. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I've never, I don't think I've, the last time I wrote a CV was when I put my CV into um, Royal Hospital Road. <laughs> I'm not really giving, they're giving me a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that yeah that was the last time I wrote a CV so 2000 and yeah 2003 so it's easy obviously to say what you look for and stuff but actually sitting down and writing that CV it's mm. it's quite hard to write about yourself right yeah yeah I think yeah yeah I think it is it, it, yeah it's tricky but it's yeah that's it's your that's this that's how you get your foot in the door that you have to sell yourself it's so important like that piece of paper or those you know those couple of pages are you selling yourself to that you know potential employer or you know yeah so it has to be you have to sell yourself and you have to make yourself sound as good as you know you are because it's all about confidence at the end of the day like to get to go and work at the fat duck or to go and work at Bennu or the hand and flowers or midsummer house or wherever like you have to walk into that interview with confidence the moment someone sees that you're confident in what you do then everything you know you're like okay well I, I can trust this guy to cook the meat and fish or I can trust this guy to you know not fuck up the chips um and yeah it's just about confidence and if you can purvey confidence in your CV and your interview then you've got more chance of getting a job I think. Ollie would you check social media accounts as well? Yeah that's one of my first things I do actually yeah if someone applies for a job I'll I'll put have a little search on Instagram see see if we can scope them out what are you looking for just like I don't know a bit about them really I suppose as well like 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 Aaron said that bit where you find out a bit more about them as a person cooking style obviously like that's interesting but then like if they have other passions and they're like you know interested in other stuff is it yeah I think that's important as well. 
so a word of warning to young chefs that put inappropriate images on their social media. Sometimes that's relevant as well. We all got a bit of a black mind. There's no, yeah, there's no harm in being, having a bit of a laughing joke. But it's so important, like working in hospitality, it's so important to have a release, like to have a hobby or something you enjoy doing. Not necessarily going out, you know, on, on your days off and getting so blasted that you can't wake up for work two days later. But, you know, once or twice a, a month is fine. Um, <laughs> but to have that really, to have that hobby, like there's so many, you can't, cooking is intense enough as it is. Like you need to be able to go, okay, well, I'm going to go and sit on the bank and go fishing for two days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or go for, you know, go for a run or, you know, go and, kick a football around or something you need that release you need that that's you know that hobby to be able to just take that deep breath and then go okay well let's go you know let's go again I, I think that's so important like yeah, yeah. I agree. Otherwise, otherwise it you know yeah it can I, th it's I think I think then like things like mental health and that come into it like if you're so super absorbed into your you know your job that that it just becomes everything then yeah. your life will ultimately, I think, suffer. Um, you know, in, in you know, in the future, I think I think you need that. You, you need something else as well. Ollie, I hope you're going to add can operator chainsaw onto your CV. Definitely underwater, underwater chainsaw. <laughs> <operative>. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what's your death row dinner? Death row dinner, probably like steak bernays. Nice. Yeah. Are you washing it down with anything or not? Yeah, but it's a cheeky red. What's your favourite restaurant? One of my favourites is Ikoi in London, I'd say. I, no. like, I like the style that's like, yeah, in a, it's so diverse. African slash, you know, Japanese. Um, that's one of my favourite restaurants, I'd say. What's your, yeah, I'd like to know your tips for, or who do you think the next three star would be? Next three star? Claude Bosi, probably. I think he's, yeah, he's been close for some years now and really <coughs> on the door. Um, that's probably the closest for three star, I reckon. Maybe Ritz for two star. So I guess now that you've won the Rue Scholarship, um, where's the, um, where are you going to go on st stage? I mean, how does that work with COVID now? Um, I don't know at the minute. I mean, we're looking at like the end of next year anyway. So. Mm. But who knows? It's hard to plan that far in advance, isn't it? So I'm looking at going to Singapore or Japan. I haven't kind of, because I've never been that side of the world so much. So yeah, I'd like to go and explore over there. That's one of the amazing things about winning it, isn't it? That just being able to yeah. choose anywhere in the world that you want to go. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Other than that, what's on the cards for you, 2022? Ollie, do you know, have you got like a plan for the, for, for the, the year coming? Um, yeah, there's some stuff stuff happening in the pipeline, but I suppose it's, it's TBC. Um, yeah, can't really say too much. It's a bit boring, I know. <laughs> no, it's like cloak and dagger. <laughs> it's boring. Well, that's boring. Yeah. Come on, no, I'm sorry. I can get you on here to start going on oh, TBC. <laughs> Ask me another question then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have got time for a, a, a question from the audience, um, and I've uh, I feel like maybe you probably should answer this, Ollie. And um, from Paul Foster, um, I'm sure you're aware of his work. Yeah. So <laughs> he wants to know why is Aaron so beautiful? <laughs> He's such a dick. <laughs> he plucks his eyebrows. He imax all over. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's twelve. Uh, that's twelve long, long years at Anne and Flowers keeps you fresh. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you do look younger than. 40 so fair play it's all like tea and toast mate oh mate thanks it's the, it's the good lighting he's got going on in the background Isn't it? <laughs> the, the it's, it's mark it's marco behind me keeps me keeps me on my toes <laughs> um and so what is your uh, new year's resolution for 2022 i want one from from both of you um and is it something that you do you do do you make a resolution or or, or not Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends how I feel. Mine, I think I'm going to take the phone out of the bedroom, buy an alarm clock, spend far too much time in bed on the phone. That is a really good show. I did that about two years ago and yeah. it's the best thing I ever did. 
Yeah. I like that one. You can't steal um, it. You have to have your own. No, all right. Uh, well, I did say that I'd need to lose a bit of weight because this, this hoodie's a little bit tight. I think just obviously year, you know, first year of Tasty has been um, challenging. Like we've all, you know, we've all had super challenging, you know, years, I guess. Um, but just to keep driving that and just, yeah, just pushing it because it's, yeah, it's super, you know, super new and it's, um, yeah, I'm excited to see where, where it goes really. Yeah. What's the story behind Tasty that people don't know then, Aaron? So why did you want to do that? You know, where did it all come from? Why think, didn't you want to stay doing what you were doing? I think one of the things that that I was that I was good at at the hand was was driving a team and an understanding people and getting them to work to and and motivate them and and I and I love. I love that to see, you know, for, for someone to stay by my side for six to eight years because they love working with me or, you know, the whole, that whole team environment. And then seeing people go off like Sophia Massetfi, who's now cooking amazing food in London. You've got George Dingle come through the Hand of Flowers who worked with me, who's now um, Misha Benjamin, Mickey Smith, who's in Hong Kong doing amazing things with Shane Osborne. And I just loved seeing people like develop and grow and recruitment agents I'm you know a majority of them all the you know some that I work with they don't care about that they care about lining their pockets and I want to be able to take you know take someone and build their career and make sure they're in the right place at the right time and and work with them to find them the right opportunities because I've got I think I've got good relationships within the industry and I can potentially open you know doors that some recruiters might not be able to then we can you know make these people get these people to be in the right places rather than throw jobs down there you know throat jordan belfort style wolf of wall street grow you know grow grow these people in the right places at the right time and make sure that they're you know they have those stepping stones in their career and and that's something i'm super passionate about i mean don't get me wrong i love the kitchen like the time i spent in there was amazing i do miss it i do miss that camaraderie and that you know being in the shit you know on a section and all those bits and pieces I love that I and and I and I do miss it but I want to work for myself and I, and I have a huge passion for the industry but the people within it and I see you know you see so many people going into the wrong jobs and like Ollie mentioned earlier like it's about thinking about where you want to be and being going into those right places and that's what I want to try and facilitate and grow I think Okay, because obviously the that's the message, guys. Okay, Jerry Springer, <laughs> final thought. <laughs> You're gonna have to come up with a new one for the next three I episodes oh, that yeah, we were yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, on that note, um, thank you both, Ollie. You've made it through grilled. I don't think you've said anything uh, that needs editing out, so we're, we're all good there. <laughs> Thank you both for joining me on Grilled. Um, Aaron, I will see you for the next one. Ollie, good luck in 2022. I have no doubt that I'll be catching up with you uh, when your TBCs appear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.